all accounts when Prince Siddhartha was still living in the palace. He was thoroughly addicted to sensual pleasure. And when he saw the drawbacks of that pleasure, he did what most addicts do. He went in the opposite direction, self-torture, self-torment. And he realized that that didn't lead anywhere either. Fortunately for us, he wasn't like most addicts who tend to go back and forth between indulgence and self-torture. He reflected, maybe there is a pleasure that is blameless. So the problem was not with the pleasure, per se, it was the way you went about trying to find it. A way that would harm yourself or harm other people. It would also intoxicate the mind. In other words, blur your vision so you really couldn't see things for what they were. And it was his discovery that there is a pleasure that's blameless, a pleasure, to put it in other terms, a pleasure that's responsible, or a way of looking for pleasure that's responsible. That was the solution. It's the problem with most of us as we look for pleasures, they're not very responsible about it. We just take what we like. And unfortunately, we live in a c culture that encourages that. Whatever pleasure you want, it's for sale. And it's gotten so there are more and more strokes for different folks. We get used to being indulged in this way. Not only do we indulge in our pleasures, but other people indulge in us in our pleasures. And we never really grow up. We never stop to think about the consequences. When you come to meditation, it's largely because you have noticed there are consequences to the way you normally look for pleasure. That's the beginning of maturity, it's the beginning of being responsible. So we come here freely admitting that we are looking for pleasure, we're looking for ease, well-being. And it's, there's no harm in really indulging in this pleasure. It's not the case that jhana is another one of those forbidden pleasures. It's really ironic. There's a tendency in a lot of places. With the first mention of the word jhana, you're warned off it. The Buddha taught this type of concentration, but it's really dangerous and it's better if you not go there. That's not how he taught it at all. He said, you need this pleasure. If you're going to be able to wean yourself away from other, more irresponsible pleasures, you've got to have the sense of well-being that comes from right concentration. And when the texts describe the mind as it's entering into right concentration, they say you settle down and indulge in your stillness. In other words, you learn to enjoy it. You look for the potential of well-being, happiness that comes simply by sitting here breathing. You learn how to sensitize yourself to that. And John Fuhrung once noted that Although the texts, especially the commentaries, will tell you that breath meditation is suitable for all people, he said it really requires a lot of refinement. You have to learn how to sensitize yourself to the pleasure that can be had simply by sitting here breathing. If you're not observant, you'll miss it. 
and the breath will just be in, out, in, out, and it will offer nothing to you. So it is an acquired taste, but it's a naturally acquired taste. In other words, it doesn't require a lot of money, doesn't require a lot of education. What it requires is a lot of just your own plain powers of observation. Noticing how the breath feels as you breathe in, and how, how it feels when you breathe out. What are the varieties in the way that it feels? How when you decide to change the way you breathe, do you make things worse? And how can you make things better? This requires that you be really observant. This is how you develop this blameless source of happiness. Because no one is fighting you for this particular bit of happiness, unlike a lot of the pleasures of the world where if you gain something, somebody else has lost it. The fact that you're sitting here breathing and being happy by breathing, feeling a sense of ease, satisfaction, gratification, fullness, nobody else loses. In fact, other people will begin to benefit as well. They're less subject to your greed, anger, and delusion. And as you find more and more of your needs for happiness here, you're going to impose yourself less and less on other people. Now the Buddha does comment that there are dangers in getting stuck on jhana, because it's not the danger in doing the jhana, doing the right concentration. Simply when you get into concentration and then refuse to use it as a basis for further insight. That's the danger. He said it's like grabbing hold of a stick and there's a little bit of resin on the stick or a little bit of resin on your hand. You get stuck there. It's not that you're going to be permanently stuck, or that jhana is in and of itself dangerous, or it's such a seductive pleasure that you will never come out. It's just that there is this tendency, once you've gotten near it feels really good. And you may decide that you don't want to go any further. But if we're to talk in terms of dangers, that's a really minor danger. Think of the dangers that come from being stuck on sensual pleasures. People kill over sensual pleasures. They lie. They cheat. All the horrible and cruel things that people do to one another in the world come primarily from being stuck on sensual pleasure, stuck on your sensual desires. And so if you were to compare these two types of pleasure, the, type, the drawbacks of jhana or the dangers of jhana are really, really minor. For the truth of the matter is, is that the pleasure of jhana is actually conducive to insight, because as you're getting more and more sensitive to the breath. You're developing the mind's powers to be more and, sensitive, more and more sensitive to its own movements, which is where the real issue is. How the mind creates a sense of becoming this or being that, and taking on a sense of identity, taking, assembling a sense of the world, what we mean by the word becoming. The practice of concentration really sensitizes you to how it's done. Being aware in the present moment is a constructed phenomenon. Moment of awareness is not the, the deathless. There's a confusion that's especially compounded in time when they talk about san sankara as thoughts. And they think, well, mindfulness, when there's not any wandering thoughts, is free from sankara. That's not the case. Mindfulness itself is a type of sankara, a type of fabrication. Your attention to the present moment is a type of fabrication. Your decision to watch the present moment is a fabrication as well. But as you get the mind into this fabrication, one, you're putting yourself in a better position to observe the grosser kinds of fabrication. And as your sensitivity improves, you can start taking apart this kind of fabrication as well. 
So it's not a dangerous pleasure, the pleasure that comes from right concentration. It's actually a helpful one. One, it helps wean you off of sensual pleasures, sensual desires. So you're not craving them all the time. You've got an alternative type of pleasure to focus on. As the Buddha once said, no matter how much you may understand and mentally assent to the fact that there are dangers in sensual pleasures, if you can't find this alternative pleasure, you're not going to give up your sensual pleasures, sensual desires. You've got to have this alternative to fall back on, to give you the strength, to give you the nourishment that you need. in order to wean yourself off of those other pleasures. At the same time, as you sensitize yourself to the potential for pleasure here, just breathing in, breathing out, you're getting closer and closer to the mind. You're getting more and more sensitive. Your powers of sensitivity are heightened. So they're equal to the task of seeing deeper inside. So in this way, your pursuit of pleasure becomes a mature activity. You've learned how to be mature about how you find pleasure in life. You've learned how to be responsible about how you find pleasure in life. You learn to be wise about how you try to find pleasure in life. And that's a lot of what it means to be mature, responsible, and wise. Because that's basically what all our activities are aimed at, is finding happiness, finding well-being, pleasure, ease. And we're simply learning how to do it in a way that really gives results, long-term results, harmless results. For harmless pleasure the is the only kind of pleasure that could be long-term. So always remain alert to the fact that there's a lot of pleasure to be found simply by the fact of being still, watching the breath. And that's a pleasure that's perfectly fine to pursue. It's a noble pursuit, as the Buddha said, this is a noble right concentration, the path of sensual Pursuits, he said, was ignoble. The path of self-torment or self-torture, he said, was also ignoble. This kind of pleasure, though, he said, is noble. And it's also ennobling, because it can take you even further to a type of pleasure that has no drawbacks at all whatsoever, does not depend on any conditions at all whatsoever. So it's taking you in the right direction, which is so different from the pleasures of the world. And for that reason, it's something really to treasure, and the opportunity to pursue this pleasure. is probably our most valuable opportunity in life. <laughs>